Section two of Letters of Mrs. Adams, Volume One, by Charles Francis Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Section two, Youthful Letters, seventeen sixty one, seventeen sixty seven. Weymouth, five October, seventeen sixty one, to Mrs. H. Lincoln. My dear friend, does not my friend think me a stupid girl when she has kindly offered to correspond with me that I should be so senseless as not to accept the offer? Senseless and stupid I would confess myself, and that to the greatest degree, if I did not foresee the many advantages I shall receive from corresponding with a lady of your known prudence and understanding. I gratefully accept your offer, although I may be charged with vanity in pretending to entertain you with my scrawls. Yet I know your generosity is such that, like a kind parent, you will bury in oblivion all my imperfections. I do not aim at entertaining. I write merely for the instruction and edification which I shall receive, provided you honor me with your correspondence. Your letter I received, and believe me, it has not been through forgetfulness that I have not before this time returned you my sincere thanks for the kind assurance you then gave me of continued friendship. You have, I hope, pardoned my suspicions. They arose from love. What persons in their right senses would calmly, and without repining or even inquiring into the cause, submit to lose their greatest temporal good and happiness. For thus the divine, Dr. Young, looks upon a true friend when he says, A friend is worth all hazards we can run. Poor is the friendless master of a world. A world in purchase for a friend is gain. Who that has once been favored with your friendship can be satisfied with the least diminution of it? not those who value it according to its worth. You have, like King Ahasuerus, held forth, though not a golden scepter, yet one more valuable, the scepter of friendship, if I may so call it. Like Esther, I would draw nigh and touch it. Will you proceed and say, What wilt thou, and what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of my heart." Why, no, I think I will not have so dangerous a present, lest your good man should find it out and challenge me. But, if you please, I'll have a place in one corner of it, a place well guarded and fortified, or still I shall fear being jostled out by him. Now do not deny my request on purpose to make me feel the weight of your observation, that we are often disappointed when we set our minds upon that which is to yield us great happiness. I know it too well already. Daily experience teaches me that truth. And now let me ask you, my friend, whether you do not think that many of our disappointments and much of our unhappiness arise from our forming false notions of things and persons. We strangely impose upon ourselves. We create a fairyland of happiness. Fancy is fruitful and promises fair, but like the dog in the fable, we catch at a shadow, and when we find the disappointment, we are vexed not with ourselves, who are really the impostors, but with the poor, innocent thing or person of whom we have formed such strange ideas. When this is the case, I believe we always find that we have enjoyed more pleasure in the anticipation than in the real enjoyment of our wishes. Dr. Young says, Our wishes give us not our wishes. Some disappointments are indeed more grievous than others. Since they are our lot, let us bear them with patience. That person that cannot bear a disappointment must not live in a world so changeable as this. And tis wise it should be so, for were we to enjoy a continual prosperity, we should be too firmly attached to the world 
ever to think of quitting it, and there would be no room to fear that we should be so far intoxicated with prosperity as to swim smoothly from joy to joy along life's short current, wholly unmindful of the vast ocean, eternity. If I did not know that it would be adding to the length of my letter, I might make some excuse for it, but that and another reason will hinder me. You bid me tell one of my sparks, I think that was the word, to bring me to see you. Why, I believe you think they are as plenty as herrings, when, alas, there is as great a scarcity of them as there is of justice, honesty, prudence, and many other virtues. I've no pretensions to one. Wealth, wealth is the only thing that is looked after now. Tis said Plato thought, if virtue would appear to the world, all mankind would be enamored with her. But now interest governs the world, and men neglect the golden mean. But to be sober, I should really rejoice to come and see you. But if I wait till I get a, what did you call em? I fear you'll be blind with age. I can say in the length of this epistle, I've made the golden rule mine. Pray, my friend, do not let it be long before you write to your ever affectionate A. S. P. S. My regards to your good man. I've no acquaintance with him, but if you love him, I do, and should be glad to see him. Weymouth, 16 April, 1764. To John Adams. Note. Mr. Adams was in Boston undergoing the process, then in vogue, of inoculation with the smallpox. My friend, I think I write to you every day. Shall not I make my letters very cheap? Don't you light your pipe with them? I care not if you do. Tis a pleasure to me to write. Yet I wonder I write to you with so little restraint. For, as a critic, I fear you more than any other person on earth, and tis the only character in which I ever did or ever will fear you. What say you? Do you approve of that speech? Don't you think me a courageous being? Courage is a laudable, a glorious virtue in your sex. Why not in mine? For my part, I think you ought to applaud me for mine. Exit Rattle Solus your Diana. And now, pray tell me, how do you do? Do you feel any venom working in your veins? Did you ever before experience such a feeling? This letter will be made up with questions, I fancy, not set in order before you, neither. How do you employ yourself? Do you go abroad yet? Is it not cruel to bestow those favors upon others which I should rejoice to receive, yet must be deprived of. I have lately been thinking whether my mamma, when I write again I will tell you something, did you not receive a letter today by Haynes? This is a right girl's letter, but I will turn to the other side and be sober, if I can. But what is bred in the bone will never be out of the flesh, as Lord M. would have said. As I have a good opportunity to send some milk, I have not waited for your orders, lest if I should miss this, I should not catch such another. If you want more balm, I can supply you. Adieu, evermore remember me with the tenderest affection, which is also borne unto you by your A. Smith. Thursday evening, Weymouth, 19 April, 1764, to John Adams. Why, my good man, Thou hast the curiosity of a girl. Who could have believed that only a slight hint would have set thy imagination agog in such a manner? And a fine encouragement I have to unravel the mystery, as thou callest it. Nothing less truly than to be told something to my disadvantage. What an excellent reward that will be! In what court of justice did thou learn that equity? I thank thee, friend, such knowledge as that is easy enough to be obtained without paying for it. As to the insinuation, it doth not give me any uneasiness. 
for if it is anything very bad, I know thou dost not believe it. I am not conscious of any harm that I have done or wished to any mortal. I bear no malice to any being. To my enemies, if any I have, I am willing to afford assistance. Therefore, towards man, I maintain a conscience void of offense. Yet by this I mean not that I am faultless, but tell me what is the reason that persons would rather acknowledge themselves guilty than to be accused by others? Is it because they are more tender of themselves, or because they meet with more favor from others when they ingenuously confess? Let that be as it will, there is something which makes it more agreeable to condemn ourselves than to be condemned by others. But although it is vastly disagreeable to be accused of faults, yet no person ought to be offended when such accusations are delivered in the spirit of friendship. I now call upon you to fulfill your promise, and tell me all my faults, both of omission and commission, and all the evil you either know or think of me. Be to me a second conscience, nor put me off to a more convenient season." There can be no time more proper than the present. It will be harder to erase them when habit has strengthened and confirmed them. Do not think I trifle. These are really meant as words of truth and soberness. For the present, good night. Friday morning, April 20th. What does it signify? Why may not I visit you days as well as nights? I no sooner close my eyes than some invisible being, swift as the Albarak of Mohammed, bears me to you. I see you, but cannot make myself visible to you. That tortures me, but it is still worse when I do not come, for I am then haunted by half a dozen ugly sprites. One will catch me and leap into the sea. Another will carry me up a precipice like that which Edgar describes in Lear, then toss me down, and were I not then light as the gossamer, I would shiver into atoms. Another will be pouring down my throat stuff worse than the witch's broth in Macbeth. Where I shall be carried next I know not, but I would rather have the smallpox by inoculation half a dozen times than be sprited about as I am. What say you? Can you give me any encouragement to come? By the time you receive this, I hope from experience you will be able to say that the distemper is but a trifle. Think you I would not endure a trifle for the pleasure of seeing you? Yes, were it ten times that trifle, I would. But my own inclinations must not be followed. To duty I sacrifice them. Yet, oh, my mamma, forgive me if I say you have forgot or never knew, but hush, and do you excuse me that something I promised you, since it was a speech more undutiful than that which I just now stopped myself in. For the present, good-bye. Friday evening. I hope you smoke your letters well before you deliver them. Mamma is so fearful lest I should catch the distemper that she hardly ever thinks the letters are sufficiently purified. Did you ever rob a bird's nest? Do you remember how the poor bird would fly round and round, fearful to come nigh, yet not know how to leave the place? Just so, they say, I hover round Tom whilst he is smoking my letters. But heyday, Mr. What's-Your-Name, who taught you to threaten so vehemently? A character besides that of a critic, in which, if I never did, I always hereafter shall fear you. Thou canst not prove a villain. Impossible. I therefore still insist upon it, that I neither do nor can fear thee. For my part, I know not that there is any pleasure in being feared. But if there is... I hope you will be so generous as to fear your Diana, that she may at least be made sensible of the pleasure. Mr. Ayers will bring you this letter and the bag. 
Do not repine, it is filled with balm. Here is love, respects, regards, good wishes, a whole wagon load of them, sent you from all the good folks in the neighborhood. Tomorrow makes the fourteenth day. How many more are to come? I dare not trust myself with the thought. Adieu. Let me hear from you by Mr. Ayers and excuse this very bad writing. If you had mended my pen, it would have been better. Once more, adieu. Gold and silver have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee, which is the affectionate regard of your A.S. Weymouth, Sunday evening, 14 September, 1767. To John Adams. My dearest friend, the doctor talks of setting out tomorrow for New Braintree. I did not know but that he might chance to see you in his way there. I know from the tender affection you bear me and our little ones that you will rejoice to hear that we are well. Our son is much better than when you left home, and our daughter rocks him to sleep with the song of, Come, Papa, come home to Brother Johnny. Sunday seems a more lonely day to me than any other when you are absent, for though I may be compared to those climates which are deprived of the sun half the year, yet upon a Sunday you commonly afforded us your benign influence. I am now at Weymouth. My father brought me here last night. Tomorrow I return home, where I hope soon to receive the dearest of friends and the tenderest of husbands with that unabated affection which has for years past, and will, while the vital spark lasts, burn in the bosom of your affectionate A. Adams. End of section 2